<laughs> we were just talking about we, we, were, we were talking we were talking about Presbyopia yeah. and the drops and how people are going to you know beat the doors down once they're here. <laughs> uh, absolutely, I'm so grateful for Presbyopia <laughs> <laughs> and great lecture, by the way. Uh, my goodness. Oh. So, Deanne, you know, you were so, giving you were giving an epic talk here today that everyone should be aware of, right? You're giving like a, a three-parter on concussion. Um, three-parter. I hope they can stand it. <laughs> well, you know, I think they got to have lots of coffee. Yeah, you because know, we were. T- I was actually talking. We were talking to you know Steve before about this. Like with my kid, who's 11. Like I think these days they don't even teach kids to use their heads in soccer anymore, right? Like they're they're people are finally starting to get aware that this is not a good thing. That's correct. So what happens is that heading the ball um, has been removed uh, in most high schools uh, or under the age of 18. So they're trying to get away from that. And then, of course, it still may be in college or professional. uh, But once again, uh, they've started to do some really good things to understand that's not a good thing to do. Right. And I mean, you've been at this a long time, right? You've you've been, you know, on, on this train for what, 30 years, 40 years, something like that? Yeah, I was I was probably ahead of the curve a little bit, which had its good points and its bad points. Um, but I really got in under uh, UPMC and Banner Clinic out in um, Phoenix, Arizona. So I came in really early and really uh, wanted to get optometry at the table. And it's taken some time. I did a Nora uh, full lecture uh, with a PT and OT back in uh, 2013. And I'd have to say that it's it's been a little slower for some optometrists to understand uh, because you've got the MDs going – well, it's motor, it's not vision. Oh my gosh, you know, close your eyes and drive your car. Uh, close your eyes and play football. <laughs> so, uh, you know, 100% of your brain's dedicated to vision in some fashion. So uh, slowly but surely what's happened is that the medical profession has either moved away because they see that it's very hard and complex um, and they don't understand uh, eyes and vision and ocular motor. So I think it's been really important. And, and like I said, I think optometry is really moving forward with it. And every level can be different, you know, can be the optometrist who does the prescription and then sees whether or not the reaction time or something's off and refers them to a, a colleague uh, to be able to help that person uh, be better uh, in athletics. And, and the number one thing, if you're better in athletics, you're better in school. Yep, there we go. And so for people who are here today, right, so obviously everyone's got some interest in sports, right, if they're listening to this today. Um, but in terms of concussion, which is something that everyone should really, you know, keep, you know, really at the, at the front of their minds with just about any sport, what are you doing in terms of testing or products or anything like that? Like if you were running practice right now, what would you recommend to people if they want to keep on top of, of the best products to use? Absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, you've got to have the best objective data. You can't, uh, you can't trade the uh, eye exam. I have to do my eye exam first, but then I have to have some things to show them with objective data. And so a uh, ride eye being an eye tracking uh, piece of equipment, that's very helpful in showing that. But i got to do cognition. And when I started out with this, it was a, it was a pen and paper product. And what happened is that it was really a slogging along whether or not you could even do that. Um, so I'm CIC certified in impact testing, which I still think is the gold standard for sports-related concussion. But it's very difficult. I've got MDs calling me all the time and going, well, what does this mean? What does that mean? And so what's really come along the horizon is much better uh, cognitive testing or, or, or stuff that's easier to use. So CNS Vital Signs um, Brain Gauge, which uses inhibitory lateral inhibition of the somatosensory. So it uses vibration on your fingertips. And then Cognivue has really stepped it up. Um, love their report, uh, love what they're able to do, and it's a little bit quicker. You know, that's the problem with impact. It's 30 to 40 minutes, and we need something quicker. I know that probably when I see that athlete, and I'm very honored and privileged that I see that athlete early. I see them within 72 hours or a week. Not everybody does that. Uh, I'm probably not going to do a heavy cognitive test, but I can do something so I can show the, the parent or the guardian or even the student athlete education, 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 to show them that their brain, brain is not – uh, bruise forever, but we got to do some things to get them better. Right. And let's, let's pause for a second and talk about Cognivue because, you know, they came out, you know, to the general OD community right before the pandemic, right? I remember seeing their stuff at like one trade show or two trade shows. And then of course we all got sidelined. Um, so for people who <laughs> yeah. don't know what this thing actually is, I put it up on the screen. Maybe you just want to explain to us what this is and how it works. Sure. Absolutely. So first of all, that was the thing. They changed their design. Their machine machine used to be pretty big. Um, they've really honed it in. It's much smaller. It's portable now. And it can do, uh, Cognitive Thrive can do a test in five minutes. 
and cognitive clarity can do one in about 10 minutes. And what happens is it's able to give a really good um, report um, that you can hand to anyone that is self-explanatory. And one of the things that sometimes people don't understand is that reaction time, and I do reaction time a lot, reaction time is a cognitive function. And so one of the ways I was just reading uh, real quick, somebody goes, well, I've got this child and, um, you know, they passed impact test. Uh, so the parents just don't believe she has a concussion. And I gave them a particular cue to do uh, as a reaction test while they did 10 push-ups, and then a reaction test and do, you know, 10 jumping jacks and then a reaction test and do 10 burpees. Guess what? She was throwing up in the waster basket. This kid is not through this concussion. Mm. And so that's why it still has to be, you know, your clinical decision making, but we got to have these tools in order to show parents and, and the student athletes that we can get them better. Right. And I'm looking, you know, at the cognitive view, the output is objective, right? So you get a number that can give you Correct. an overall score, right? So it's, it's, it makes it much easier to actually come up with some objective data that you can use. Absolutely. And sometimes these, you know, let's say they, they come in and they get a, a score. There's five, you can do five sections. Let's say they get a score in one section that's 52 and you're working with them and they're still complaining maybe of headaches or we're trying to do maybe uh, symptom limiting uh, types of physical activity. And they're still kind of complaining, hey, this isn't working out well. Put them back on that test within three to five days. And if they've reduced that, meaning that now they're scoring 36, we're not doing the right things for them. So the call gives you can really give some good objective data to tell us whether or not we're moving that student athlete in the right direction. Right. And do you ever have coaches come to you and ask, like, are they clear now? And you can sort of use this objective data to say at least, well, we, we know this is how far they've come, you know, whatever your comfort level is of getting the person back out there. Absolutely. So what I do, though, is I go there a go or no go. I don't use the concussion word much uh, unless I still have some good data. But the coach will come to me and say, you know, when is this kid going to be ready? Well, coach, there are no go. And they just look at you. They don't really know how to answer with that other than the fact I'm protecting their brain, right? right. And I just tell the coach, there are no go. Their reaction time is terrible. They can't walk down the field. Um, they still get headaches. And I said, and the player is 10. You know, uh, so when sometimes when the parents and the coaches get so excitable, we have to have that objective data so we can pull that emotion out and show them that we're here to protect that child and the adult uh, from a continued uh, injury. Right, because I would imagine that this is one of the highest pressure situations an optometrist can face other than someone who's failed a driving sure. test, right? <laughs> is getting Absolutely. the kid back out on the That's, field. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. so sometimes Do what ends up happening... I don't know what that is, sorry. Uh, so sometimes what happens is that in, in most states, optometry doesn't have the ability to um, uh, release to play. So because of my clinic and because I've been doing this for so long and I'm CIC certified, uh, we have the ability to release them to school first and then release them to either the athletic trainer or release them with the athletic trainer on what we want to do. And I love that organization uh, type of skill because, you know, the athletic trainer, we got to have them in our corner. They do neck down very efficiently. We do neck up. And so as a result, what's, what's going to be, and when you say the moneymaker, I don't mean that a 10-year-old ought to have a moneymaker, but... If you're working with that brain, if you can make them more efficient with their vision, their brain, their vestibular, guess what? They're going to be a better student. They're going to be a better athlete, uh, and they're not going to get concussed. Yep. Yeah, and I'm kind of wondering with the Cognivu device itself, I wonder, you know, for people who, again, are thinking about implementing this, can you use this on sort of a broader range of people in your office? I mean, you know, people who not necessarily playing contact sports, right, like football, but this is something that you might want to get a baseline of anyway. Um, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. We, we, we love talking about the athlete, right? But my, my athletes are 0 to 100. You know, I'll see Mabel. She's 69 years of age. Glenn has macular degeneration. She still has to haul him to the doctor. She has to go get groceries, and she picks up her grandchildren at the end of school. So if I'm not helping Mabel get better, or maybe Mabel and Glenn love to play pickleball. I've got uh, a gal, a uh, husband and wife. I've got several husband and wife teams that do sports vision performance with me, and they're 72 years of age. <laughs> wow. Yes. And we can show that their cognition is improving because they're playing pickleball. So one of the things that you really want to light up for them is that I can only get you better if I can move you. And if you have fun while you're moving with pickleball or whatever they pick, um, then that increases their cognitive activity. Yep. 
and you know one of the the questions that we you know have, have faced or or you know there's this pre sort of preconceived notions about vision therapy um and what it is and what it has been in the past in optometry and it sounds like you know you're sort of moving it into a a more objective space and a more modern space oh absolutely well thank you for saying that um, if I can't move the, the patient or the athlete, I can't get them better. And that athlete can be an 80-year-old dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's patient, or they can be something else. It doesn't matter. But if I can't move them, I can't make them better. And the thing of it is, is if we're moving them, we know that saccades make the posture better. We know that their reaction time can be better if we work with their saccades. So there's all sorts of literature to show that the ocular motor and vision play a key role in getting these um, kids and adults uh, moving and moving safely. Absolutely. And again, I'm putting it up on the screen. The CognitiveView test, there's two different ones, right? There's two, it looks like there's two different devices here. What's the difference between the two? Yeah, there's a Cognitive, uh, CognitiveView Thrive and Cognitive Clarity. And what happens is the uh, Cognitive Thrive is a little shorter uh, screener kind of uh, avenue to go to, and the Cognitive Clarity is a little longer. Uh, for my office and for what I want to do, I, I, I got the, the uh, cognitive clarity. I like what it's able to do um, and, and be able to pin it against some different types of things and different types of data to see where we're at. Right. And so this is a fairly easy system to set up if, you know, you want to order one. Is it a big, a big deal to actually learn how to use or is it fairly straightforward? Oh, gosh, very easy to use. I think probably the biggest challenge at first is just people getting over that cognition and how we test for it and what we can do with it is within our repertoire. You know, if 90% of cognition is in the cerebellum, and if I'm putting yoked prisons on someone, I'm changing that cerebellum, I'm changing that cognition, I have to know what it is I'm doing uh, with those apparatuses and see which direction they're going. So optometry should be front and center with this. Right, and I just pulled up on the screen so people can see what the actual output, the reports are. It's almost like a, a gauge, right, like, a, like in a car. Uh, showing people absolutely things. so it looks fairly straightforward to understand and you know there's going to be a snapshot in time so sometimes even though you've got that student athlete or that athlete zero to 100 getting better and maybe the scores may not be reflecting quite as nicely as you want there's a reason why and once again that's why we want to have this objective data and then we want to say okay why is this particular entity not moving in the direction we think it should and then we can take a look at that and then we find out, oh, you know, Mabel didn't tell us or Johnny didn't tell us that somebody came up and whacked him in the head. And now we have a little difference in what's going on. So it's, it, it, once again, it does a great snapshot in time. It gives a great report. So that helps with uh, when you bill for insurance. And then it helps be more solid. I do a lot of workman's comp uh, and a lot of um, athlete uh, injuries that may go through school insurance. And once again, a report like that makes my job a lot easier. Right. And, you know, this year has been, I what think, a profession. Yep. Good. Good. No, I was going to say this year has been actually really difficult for people to keep up on tech trends in a lot of ways, right? I mean, we're all so isolated from each other. And I know that, you know, you tend to keep on sort of the forefront of what's going on in the latest technology. How are you actually keeping up, you know, with, with the field and all the latest tech? Because I know things have been happening, even though none of us can see it, right? Because we're all locked away. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, what we have to do, my, my focus has been how can I find things that can be more of that social distancing? How can I get good information keeping my patients safe, especially my elderly? And can I do something at home or can I do something in a in a, an arena situation where I can keep them isolated? So, you know, that's why looking at cognitive being portable, looking at brain gates being uh, even a home use. So when we look at those types of things, then I might have somebody be coming to me from a nine state area. I have to come up with something that they're going to be able to do at home for maybe a couple of weeks and then come in and see me, and then we can do that follow-up care. Because um, I just saw a gentleman uh, yesterday uh, came all the way from Kansas City, which is about a five-hour trip, and there's no one around him doing what we're doing, and he comes and sees me once a month. I have to make it very effective for him, and I have to show him that he's getting better. Right. Yeah. So that so between right eye and cognitive view and some of the things that really do a great um, uh, objective report, then once again that helps me. Like with him, he's military, so I'm able to send that to his um, head of his department, and then we keep getting up to be able to do sessions with him um, because we're able to show that we are getting improvement, that we are making a difference. 
right? And in fact, I want to just, you know, in the remaining minutes that we have here, I wanted to show everyone up on the screen. Um, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Shudlowski is going to be giving a talk, right, all about the importance of doing a good cognitive screening for all athletes. So I wanted to remind folks, uh, in addition to watching your, you know, your epic <laughs> three-part series on concussion, <laughs> this is probably one that they also want to stick around for about how to actually do a good cognitive screening for all athletes, whether they're play contact sports or not. It's probably a really useful thing to do. Oh, gosh, yes. You know, the, the key thing is everybody always wants to know, too, how can I decrease my chair time but increase my uh, effective as being a, a therapist or a doctor? And by having these kinds of tests and being able to do this kind of objective data, like with Cognivue, I can build that out to a highest report and be able then to get appropriately paid for my time. So that's what makes that really important. And I think Charles really brings that home. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to sitting through through your lectures as well. And, uh, you know, if anyone has any questions, I'm sure they're going to, I'll forward them on to you because I'm sure they will. Uh, they always send them to me. But if I get any, I'll forward them on to you. Okay. And uh, yeah, thank you for being here today. Yeah. Hey, Adam, as always, thank you. I hope your family don't, is safe. Uh, <laughs> don't run away yet. When we, one area we, we didn't discuss, if you have five more minutes. Sure. Yeah. It took, let's talk economics. Who pays the bills for these things? <laughs> you mean as far as the equipment or the exam? No, 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 the exams. Is it the Veterans Administration? Is it the military? Is it out oh, yeah. Pocket? So, so yes, I, I've been able to get a military contract uh, with the VA. And so we are able to do, uh, we, we were able to procure that back in uh, 2017. So with the military, I have that. And then uh, I'm able to bill insurance. And we do billing and coding a lot. And so anybody can call my office. We can help them uh, do the correct uh, billing and coding so they get reimbursed appropriately. So what happens is that I might take a student athlete of uh, 0 to 100 years of age, and I start them out in a concussion protocol. And once I get them to the point to where I can release them to school or release them to sport, then I change them to my sports performance. And so they're coming in to see me, and then that becomes cash basis. That's no longer uh, insurance-based. And so as a result, we have this really nice continuum of people coming in and being able to utilize um, our uh, equipment or our staff. Hmm. Right. Okay. Excellent. Well, Great that, answer. That is thank good you. To know. All right. Well, Deanne, thank you so much for being here and I look forward to watching your lectures. Hey, thanks, Adam. You have a great day. You